Well, hey, biology. Hope you're doing well when you watch this video. We're starting uh, our unit on plants, the glorious God giving organisms that allow us to live. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. So, if life had a color, what would it be? Well, my favorite color is red. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because I like the Cincinnati Reds when I was little, or just I've always liked the color red. Um, but if life had a color, it would be green, of course, because plants photosynthesize, and green is the color that is reflected by the major pigments, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So why are plants important? If I were to ask you this question in class, there's an orange tree. We live in Florida, so a lot of orange trees are gone because of developments, but nonetheless, there's still some huge groves around. Um, why are plants important? You would probably say, uh, hopefully, would say stuff like food, um, you know, medicines. Uh, of course, they are the foundation of food webs, and so and they give a lot of you know properties. Filtering, you know, some some of them filter and help the soil, and it's it's really awesome to kind of see. So plants have a lot of different goals. Well, this lesson is going to cover two. Uh, the topics in chapter 22, um, and the first thing we're going to start with is describing what plants need to survive, how plants first evolved, of course, according to naturalistic science, we believe God created plants as a kind in Genesis and a Christian school, identify the feature that defines most plant life cycles. So first off, what is a plant? Well, organisms in the kingdom of plantae are eukaryotes, which means they have a true nucleus, they have cell walls, contain cellulose, and carry out those, and this is using chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So here is a diagram of a plant cell. You can see that there's a cell wall here. We don't have that, of course, as as uh, animals. You know, we don't we don't have that here. So that cell wall is very rigid and protective. All cells have a cell membrane. Without that cell membrane, we cannot control homeostasis inside and outside environments. So you have to have a cell membrane. But everything else is very similar to an adult. Uh, not to an adult, but to an animal cell. But you can also see here, chloroplasts are different. They've, uh, that was a horrible star. They, uh, looks like a messed up A. There you go, there's an A. Chlorophyll, chloroplasts, of course, allows plants to photosynthesize. Vacuoles are, sometimes there's a central vacuole, which is hu this huge place where they store water and various uh, fluid. This is, um, if you've ever seen celery and you crunch celery, if, you, if there's a crunch to celery, it means there's a lot of water in that central vacuole. And if the water, if the celery is flimsy, it means there's not much water. And this is what happens when you see like flowers or plants wilt. The vacuoles are reducing um, their content of water. And so, so that's an example of a cell wall. So first off, plant needs. Well, plants obviously need pho sunlight for photosynthesis. They need to be able to exchange ga uh, gas. They need oxygen for cellular respiration. And they need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Cell plants do use cellular respiration you know taking in glucose and oxygen making atp they do that without that atp they wouldn't be able to live so they do that sometimes uh students only think that plants photosynthesize but that is false they also cellular they also do cellular respiration they also need water and minerals if you ever added fertilizer to a garden or to a yard you you've added minerals potassium and nitrogen structures uh limits Water loss, you know, so there's different structures that allow plants to conserve water. So as far as from a naturalistic perspective, um, just learning what evolution says, plants or originate in the water according to naturalistic evolution. Remember, naturalism is trying to explain life and meaning without God. Um, everything can be explained naturally. So fitness, so plants were favored, uh, you know, fitness level wise when they could draw water from the soil. So when, when plants evolved the ability to draw water from the soil, resist drought, reproduce without water, this was an increase in fitness. So here's a fossilized plant picture from your textbook, um, Cuxonia, I think, which dates back 425 million years. Again, some Christians, like I always tell you, would be fine with that date, some would not. This fossil shows that the branch stock that bore reproductive structures at their tips. So that's a fossilized plant. So here's a cladogram of plants also from your book. So here's your plant ancestor, something like a green algae. And then we go through different um, trait evolutions. Embryo uh, formation, true water conducting tissues, seeds, and then finally flowers and seeds enclosed in a fruit. But you can see here that the dominant species on the planet, if, as far as plants go, if you think of a plant, you probably think of a plant that makes a flower. 
Um, sometimes flowers can be very, very small. Grasses are flowering plants. Um, my favorite plant, probably just because I grew up with one in my yard, and it just every time I drove home, I saw it, and every time I walked into the garage door, I saw it, um, the door in the garage. But it's a hibiscus plant. I love hibiscus. And so, but you can see here that they've dominated the scene. And so this is obviously an advantage, increases fitness level somehow, some way, which we'll talk more about, probably not in this video, but later on. So plants have a reproductive cycle called alternation of generations. The life cycle of an organism alternates between diploid, which is 2N, right, two copies of the chromosome, and haploid, which is just N. So this is N, and this is 2N, okay? So you can see here that meiosis produces haploid cells. Through mitosis, that's, that's a haploid individual. This is an example of a fern. And the haploid individual divides um, and then combines with another gamete, fertilization. There it is, the combination of gametes. Develops into the zygote developing organism, and that zygote develops into the adult organism as far as um, through mitosis. So you can see here the, another picture of alternation of generations. So there's some terms here that we're going to need to know. I'll tell you more on the side, but gametophyte and sporophyte. Gametophyte and sporophyte are terms that you will need to know. So you can see here, sperm and eggs combine in fertilization, produce a sporophyte, which is the 2N, the diploid stage. Though that sporophyte produces spores, which are haploid, and that haploid develops into the gametophyte. So some definitions, again, all these definitions are in your book. You do need to know all the definitions for the quiz and the, and the coming up test. Multicellular diploid. Uh, called sporophyte produces haploid spores. The multicellular haploids are called gametophytes. Okay, gametophytes produce gametes, which is the, where their name comes from. Gametes, of course, are sex cells, eggs, and sperm. So the re reduction in size of the gametophyte and the increase in size of the sporophyte was an example is an example of a trend in plant evolution. So you can see here that orange is the haploid gametophyte. And look how large it is in the green algae. And still mosses is large and ferns is relatively large. But you can see in seed plants, and this is like a conifer, pine cone, you can see that the, the gametophyte is small. And so that increased in fitness because the larger sporophyte could survive and also has better adaptations for surviving in the wild. So question part one, how do botanists classify the five major groups of plants? Remember, I want these questions emailed to me preferably or put on LMS. So that's question part one, okay? Objectives in section two, I want to, you to be able to compare and contrast green algae, bryophytes, and vascular plants. I want you to be able to explain why vascular tissue is important and an advantage to plants. And then finally, identify adaptations that allow seed plants to reproduce without water. I don't know if you remember your youth age days when you are like in elementary school, but Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed, I'm pretty sure there's a song or something. I don't remember. That's, that's probably pretty sad. But Johnny Appleseed was actually a real person. Uh, he definitely is, uh, you know, his name was John Chapman, I believe. And he, he was a nurseryman. He loved plants and nature. And he introduced apple trees to large parts of Pennsylvania, and Ohio, Indiana, uh, West Virginia. And he became an American legend while still alive due to his kind and generous ways and due to his important... Uh, his ways of also taking care of the planet and caring for the planet. He was also interesting to know, you might not know this, he was also a missionary for the new church. Um, and he's, of course, in many you know museums and historical sites. So there's plants that make seeds, um, and you eat lots of seeds, I'm sure. Various nuts, legumes, all sorts of, you know, uh, ways that plants reproduce but seedless plants there's also seedless plants and so if you've ever seen a scene like this this has a lot of seedless plants in it okay so first off green algae algae refers to any so algae is like a unique term but algae refers to any photosynthetic you carry up other than a land plant so it's kind of like this broad collective term but these are seedless plants so first plants in evolution mindset okay Mostly aquatic, which means they need to be near water. They have to absorb moisture and nutrients directly from surroundings. So there's no specialized tissue. We're talking all about diffusion here and osmosis. There's nothing else going on with these plants, um, these algae. So you can see here two pictures from your textbook, colonial algae, and then uh, evidence that multicellular organisms could evolve from single-celled versions 
Um, that's just an example of evolution trying to explain how we got multicellular organism from one single cell. Bryophyte is another term you need to know. Any green seedless plant, and it's either mosses, hornworts, or liverworts. So they're the simplest of terrestrial plants. They lack complex tissues. So this is kind of like gra a green carpet, green shag carpet on the forest floor. I don't know if you've ever seen this or not. But again, mosses, that's what mosses are. How do they stay attached? They have something really cool called rhizoids. So these are like microscopic root-like structures. They're not roots though, but they anchor plants to surface. And so this is underneath the microscope. You can see here these rhizoids anchor these bryophytes to the surface that they're growing on. Mosses and other bryophytes. So here's, so th again, this is, it seems like this would be very large, but we're talking centimeters here. Um, so you have the large gametophyte producing gametes, and then you have the sporophyte, which is the two in producing spores. So mosses have protective coating that makes them resistant to drying out. So that's an increase in the fitness. Rhizoids are in, uh, connecting them to the land or where they're anchored to. So that is also important. So some other terms you need to know about bryophytes, group including, you know, where I talked about that, mosses, high, higher degree of cell specialization. We're going to see that as we continue down that cladogram. Among the first land plants, according to secular evolution, and they're very, very small, very, very small. So here's some pictures here of bryophytes. You have your mosses, liverworts, here's your hornworts right over here. Those are the examples of that. And so you can see here, this might be a little blurry, I guess, but sorry about that. But you can see that uh, meiosis produces spores. So let's just start with spores, right? Spores grow into the male and female gametophytes. Archegonia produces eggs. Antheridia produces sperm. That combines in fertilization, and then the zygote develops into the sporophyte, which is the 2N. The sporophyte produces spores. So there is your life cycle. But mostly, you don't, when you think of a plant, you don't think about that. You think of this wildflowers in a field maybe you know a tree a various uh you know seed producing plant well there's different there's different seed producing plants so first off seed producing plants are also vascular plants and vascular tissues are was in, according to secular evolution an extreme advantage when it comes to plants carry nutrients more efficiently than bryophytes vascular tissue they're also called tracheophytes because of tracheids, water conducting cells that are hollow tube like. Tracheids arrange themselves to end up uh, to end to end to make up xylem, which carries water. Some of y'all might remember this from life science if you have me in life science. And phloem, food, which carries, transports solutions of nutrients and photosynthetic products like food. So all those terms would be important for you to know. Vascular tissue is literally similar to our conductive system. Not, of course, exactly, but we do have tubes inside our bodies as humans, and it's called a circulatory system. Y'all know I teach anatomy, so I love anatomy. But those you know, tubes in our body carry nutrients and hormones and, and oxygen, of course, attached to red blood cells, and they're necessary for us to survive. Well, plants that have tubes within them too, and they're pathways that allow water and nutrients to be transported. So it is an advantage from an evolutionary standpoint. So vascular tissue, again, comes in three different types. Xylem, which carries water. Phloem, which carries food. And the cambium, which produces new uh, vascular tissue. So let's go over each one just a little bit more. Xylem, again, carries uh, water. And sometimes they come in tracheids. So tracheids here are like tapered ends. Um, they're shorter in length. Some plants have tracheids. Uh, xylem found, found in all, you know, sorry, all types of vascular plants. And then vessels are only in angiosperms. And when angiosperms, we're not going to talk about in this video, but angiosperms are plants that produce flowers and fruits. And so a vessel is formed by several cells arranged end to end. So this is like wider. You can see here, this is an advantage to tracheids. That, um, that kind of summarizes xylem. And here's just another picture of xylem elements. You can see your trachea is tapered from end to end. And then the vessels are kind of like these huge tubes, like straws kind of um, inside of a plant. Phloem conducts food. So that's the big key there. Conducts food, nutrients, photosynthetic products, which of course photosynthesis is making that glucose, that rich carbon compound. Um, phloem has different elements here. You can see here that the sieve element is the conducting element, which allows you know, nutrients to move. 
companion cells are the life support. So that they give the cell like ATP and various things. Fibers are for protection and parenchyma is a material between other types of cells and helps to transport materials. That's just kind of the arrangement of phloem. So here's questions part two. I want you to contrast xylem, phloem, tracheids, and vessels. And then I want you to answer why would having vascular tissue be an advantage? Okay, remember we're thinking kind of like in evolutionary terms here, but not really. I mean, just from an advantage from creation. Why would it be an advantage? Vascular tissue. Seedless vascular plants. So again, vascular plants can either produce seeds or not produce seeds. And we're going to start with seedless ones. So there's three phyla, commonly known as club mosses, horsetails, and ferns. Ferns are the most common. You've seen ferns. I'm going to show you some pictures here. Ferns have vascular tissue, strong roots, and fronds. We're going to explain what fronds are. Thrive with little light. They obviously need water. So here's a picture of a fern. I'm sure you've seen them around. You live in Florida, and they're all over Florida, and that's actually going to be a part of your question here. But a fern is a member of a group of 12,000 different species. These are fronds. So ferns, literally, the leaves kind of fold up and uh, unravel, sort of. Um, you can watch really cool time-lapse videos on YouTube if you want about fronds. So questions part three. I want you to research a type of fern in Florida. They're all over the place. Um, so look up different types of ferns in Florida, classify it, I mean like domain through species, you know, Linnaean classification, and, sorry, that should be a D there, and <laughs> tell me what it requires to grow sufficiently, meaning like what kind of pH does the soil need, does it need, how much, you know, does it need a lot of water, what about sunlight, various things like that, what does it need to be able to grow? So let's look at a life cycle of a fern. So you can see here meiosis, production of sex cells, fertilization, and then mitosis. So you can see spore, let's start with the spore always. Spore produces the gametophyte. Again, that's a haploid organism. The gametophyte, anthridium produces sperm, archegonium produces eggs, fertilization happens, and then you have your two and your diploid organism, the zygote. The zygote forms into the sporophyte, and that develops into your mature uh, sporophyte. If you ever look, looked on the back of fern leaf, sometimes you'll see spores that look like this. That's just another picture if you want to pause. It's a little bit blurry, but that's just another picture from your book. But here's uh, spores. So if you ever looked on the back of ferns, or the next time you see a fern, look on the back of the leaves and see if you can see little tiny spores. Those are the haploid on top of the leaf, which is the diploid. I want you to answer also these questions for me. So I want you to read, so I would pause this and read this slide. This is also found in your book. I want you to pause this and answer these questions, keeping ferns in check. And then finally, when you think about plants, again, you probably think about plants that make seeds. Seeds can be used for food for lots of different organisms, um, and it's really important. So one of my you know, favorite stories in the Bible is the parable of the sower. And Jesus is talking in Matthew 13, and he's, he's telling parables. He's trying to illustrate kingdom uh, messages in, in everyday language, kingdom truths, truth of the gospel. And so he says... Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. When the sun had risen, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And I've heard a couple of different messages about this, about what kind of soil are you, what kind of soil is your heart um, because Jesus gives some strong warnings here he, he ta he's talking to us about receiving his gospel the good news receiving his word and and clinging to it trusting in it hoping in it, obeying it and so he says later on in Matthew 13 he says when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it the evil one comes and snatches it away so that's like the birds the one whom the seed was sown on the rocky places this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy okay so it's like oh this is awesome this is great news Yet he has no firm root in himself, Jesus says, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, because when you're a Christian, guys, life will be tough, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth, 
some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. In order to understand the word of God, we have to be able to have our eyes open by God, but also to cling and obey him and trust in him. So a good question to ask yourself is what kind of soil are you? I would I would check out Matthew 13. Seeds are very, uh, you know, obviously an advantage to survival. Basically, a seed is a baby in a suitcase carrying its lunch. So the baby is like the ba the immature plant. The suitcase is the seed coat that surrounds the, the seed. And then the lunch refers to the nutritive source for the germinating seedling. So that's why we eat seeds if you ever, you know, eat seeds. Here's some examples of pictures of seeds. There's different types of them, you know, monocon, dicots. I'm not going to go into that with you right now. But corn, common bean. You can see the embryo there, baby plants. So seed plants uh, came about because they were able to carry tiny living plants ready to sprout. So again, this was an advantage as far as secular evolution goes. Plant embryo in a food supply, diploid, common ancestors. So here's the secular evolution, common ancestors for all modern seed plants. And so these are some adaptations. Cones and flowers allow seeds to be produced. Pollination is an advantage because it doesn't involve water, so you can fertilize without water. Seeds, of course, protect the baby plants, so that increases the ability to survive. So there's two different types of seed-bearing plants. There's gymnosperms and angiosperms. Gymnosperms is a picture from your book. I would definitely know how to like contrast gymnosperms and angiosperms. Gymnosperms are basically, like literally, they mean naked seeds because the seeds aren't enclosed in flesh and a fruit. And so literally male cones produce the male gametophytes, the pollen. Female cones produce the female gametophytes. And then wind carries the pollen to the seed cones. And that develops into fertilization. You see the angiosperms here. Most flowers produce both male and female gametophytes. So there's both on each flower, which we'll talk more about flowers in another video. Some species have separate male and female flowers, which is unique. But wind, again, or animals, pollen. Animals carry pollen directly. The honey bee, honey bees are so important. Bees are so important when it comes to pollination. And then an ovary develops into a fruit. So once that fertilization happens, that a fruit develops that encases that seed, which, which is an advantage to the plant for many different reasons, which we'll talk about later. So gymnosperms literally mean naked seed. And some examples of gymnosperms are like conifers, which are pine trees, cycads, ginkgo biloba, which is more of a rare situation. But you can see here, here's the life cycle. Again, let's follow this along. Let's start with the seeds. So we don't have spores anymore. We have seeds or pollen and gametophytes. So the male gametophytes are the pollen grains. You have the female gametophyte. Okay. Fertilization happens. Pollen tube. That's a really complicated situation that I'm not going to discuss. But pollen tube basically delivers the sperm to the egg. Eggs, and then the egg cells, the zygotes form after fertilization. The embryo planted germinated seed and then the seedling and then years and years and years you get that huge pine tree the uh conifer um and then that produces gametophytes after that so question part five is i want you to go to this website right here i'll try to put a link in the description if i remember <laughs> and research five differences between a palm tree which we see all over the place um in florida and a balsam fir a balsam fir so there's four types of gymnosperms here. Sorry about cutting the, the rest of the word off. But you can see here, here's a cycad native to Florida. Here's uh, netophytes. Netophytes are an example of a ginkgo biloba, a rare kind of tree. And we see pine trees all over the place, especially if you drive on like country roads. Um, conifers are all over the place. So those are five types of gymnosperms. So that's where we will stop for today. I hope this video was helpful. If you've watched the entire thing, I'm so happy and proud of you. Um, please email me those questions. And if you have any other questions or concerns, please let me know. Until next time, I'll talk to you later.